Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ina Woben, and I'm the Managing Director of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. And um, welcome to the CLSA webinar series. These are our monthly online lectures to provide a forum to um, discuss the latest on health and aging research in Canada and internationally. So I will shortly introduce our speaker for today, but just a few housekeeping uh, items uh, as is listed on the slide that you see right now. Uh, this webinar does not allow you to have um, voice interaction, but you can type your questions in the chat box in the left corner of your screen. And at the end of uh, Dr. Agarwal's presentation, I will will summarize those questions and moderate them and uh, put them forward to the speaker and he will then answer your questions. Um, so I want to again wel welcome you to our CSA webinar series. Our speaker today is Dr. A.J. Agarwal who is a clinical oncologist and visiting senior research fellow at the Institute of Cancer Policy at King's College in London. Um, he is currently undertaking an NIHR doctoral research fellowship at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where he is investigating the impact of provider choice on outcomes for men with prostate cancer. Um, Dr. Agarwal uh, has a Master's in Science of Cancer from the Institute of Cancer Research and a Master's in Health, Population and Society from the London School of Economics. Um, he has previous international experience working with the WHO in Geneva and his current research interests include cancer economics and the development of strategies for the delivery of demonstrating this uh, with Mexico as a case. Many thanks, Ina. So thanks Dr. Agarwal, the floor is yours. So just in terms of an overview of the presentation I'm going to be doing, I'm going to explain the study rationale, which just comes down to this essential point that we know a lot about a that there's going to be a lot of aging within middle-income countries and that the cancer burden is going to increase. But what does it mean for an elderly person in a middle-income country suffering from cancer? And I want, really wanted to do an exploratory analysis. And I initially actually started this when I was at the London School of Economics and worked with collaborators at the Institute of Cancer Policy, who I now do work with, as well as the National Cancer Institute in Mexico. So I'll go through the methods that I used, the results of the analyses, and also have a wider discussion about the conclusions I made from this and the policy implications. So if I just start off with the study rationale, if we look back at the epidemiological transition, which I know many of you were aware, but essentially Omran proposed his hypothesis in the early 70s that we're shifting through a variety of stages based on our disease epidemiology, our risk factor burden, and many middle-income countries are moving towards the age of man-made and degenerative diseases, which is caused by socioeconomic development, change in risk factors from infectious diseases, to more non-communicable diseases caused by uh, obesity, alcohol, smoking, etc. And this shift from communicable to non-communicable diseases varies between countries and within countries themselves, with many affected by a dual burden of disease. What resulted in happening in this shift is essentially that infant mortality fell, uh, increase in life expectancy and population expansion. And with the fall in fertility rates as well, there's a demographic transition where the proportion of elderly is increasing and expected to continue to increase. So from currently being 8% of the world's population being over 65, the majority of which in high-income countries, this is going to increase to 16% by 2050, which is some 1.5 billion people. 80% will be living in low- and middle-income countries. And one of the factors uh, to point out is that the rate of aging has been much greater in middle-income countries than in high-income countries, um, where it's taken several decades uh, for the aging process to occur. And as a result, the ab ability for social, social health uh, infrastructure to manage this is very different. Just as a point of, uh, just uh, sort of to illustrate this point, between 2010 and 2030, some population projections, the percentage of over 65 is expected to increase by up to 90 to 100% in both Brazil and China, whereas in the UK and US it's expected to be about between 30 and 
And this was a table that created uh, from UN population data, just essentially showing over that 20 year period between 2010 and 2030, countries and the expected increase in the proportion of the population over 65. Those with a higher proportion tend to be uh, emerging economies, middle income co uh, economies, compared to those with lower rates in high income countries. But what does this mean? So we know that there's a rise in the proportion of elderly within the population of those over 65. But we know that over the time course with increasing risk factors over the life course and the accumulation of mutations, that the rate of cancer is increasing as well. And aging has been described as the dominant driver of this. By 2030, of the 20 million case, new cancer cases worldwide, currently it's 12 million, uh, million new cancer cases a year, 70% will be in emerging economies. And it's not just that, it's the profile of the cancers themselves. So whereas in the high income countries, we're looking at those cancers due to behavioral risk factors such as smoking, obesity, and alcohol, so lung, colorectal, and prostate cancers, a number of cancers within low and middle income countries are due to infectious disease agents. So for instance, H. pylori infection causing gastric and esophageal cancers, HPV and human papillomavirus for cervical cancer. Um, and so the, the burden varies. What we also know is that the relative disability adjusted life years affects low middle income countries greater than high income countries, and this is due to premature mortality. When you compare the mortality to incidence ratio as a proportion, individuals who have cancer in low middle income countries have higher rates of mortality relative to high income countries, as you can see from these percentages. And that's primarily when you're moving from a, uh, a model which is looked at managing communicable diseases, a vertical model, and then you move to cancer, which is so dynamic, it really exemplifies or tests the whole health system, looking at prevention, screening, the diagnostics, needing imaging and biopsy, histopathology services, and then into the complex treatments with surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. Many countries lack the infrastructure needed to meet the current demand. And in fact, in managing this, uh, individuals face catastrophic financial expenditures. Another statistic that's worth noting is that of the cancer research budget or the global expenditure in cancer R&D, only about 3% of this is directly relevant to low and middle income countries. So what, what I'm essentially trying to say is that cancer care is about systems, it's about exposure to risk factors, sustainability and outcomes. So it's not just an issue of the health system, it's an issue wider than that. It's about society and political economy. And it really does um, magnify the, and expose all of the strengths and weaknesses of a health system, unlike for other chronic diseases. As a result of this, there's been a number of uh, publications within the Lancet Oncology, and here just a couple of them over the last four or five years, looking at how cancer care control programs can be implemented within low and income countries. And there's one just below looking at Latin America and the Caribbean, which was published a couple of years ago. And these are focused on a variety of important issues, so public health, have strategies to manage risk factors such as smoking, uh, improving access to screening and diagnostic investigations. Uh, looking at the individual, how from the, the costs of diagnosis um, and treatment and ongoing follow-up, how can they be protected from the financial costs uh, in circumstances where they don't have any social health insurance? And how can we ensure that there's an equitable availability in all parts of the country for, for these services? But one thing that hasn't been looked at, even though ageing has been seen as the main driver, what is the impact on the elderly within these countries faced with the diagnosis of cancer. The reason why I mentioned this is that we know, as I mentioned, that it disproportionately affects the elderly um, in high income, can, uh, affects the elderly in high income countries. But we also know that the relative survival of elderly is much worse compared to younger persons. So there's been a lot of research, uh, um, observational work done uh, predominantly in Europe, but there have been other studies that have found there have been a variety of issues why this gap exists and why it's continuing to widen. One aspect is the disease biology itself. Uh, do elderly uh, individuals have more aggressive phenotypes? 
do they have do they have more poorer functional status, so multi-morbidity making uh, the ability to deliver aggressive treatments or um, delaying presentation. There's also aspects of barriers to accessing care, so uh, uptake of screening or screening applying to these age groups, um, recognition of symptoms. An advanced stage of diagnosis has been a bit big issue, so stage for stage, the elderly present with a more advanced stage of disease than their younger counterparts. And I think a big issue is the inadequacy of treatment. And whether you know people like to admit it or not, there is an inherent ageism uh, towards cancer care uh, within elderly populations. And we know this because there's under-treatment for chemotherapy, surgery uh, particularly, and also radiotherapy in men and women over the age of 70 in particular. But we have a very limited understanding of cancer and aging in middle income countries, whether the same issues apply to the elderly in middle income countries. Specifically, what is the current and projected cancer burden in elderly given this demographic transition? What are their outcomes from care? What are the risk factors um, which might impact on their access? So this might be health system effects, it might be their own socioeconomic circumstance, and it might be wider psychosocial or cultural issues which may be either prevent the diagnosis or fear um, or um, personal support uh, during the cancer pathway. And also, is there any evidence-based management for the cancer in the elderly? This is often a unique population with its own sort of physiological profile in which treatments need to often be tailored for this group. I and mean, it's not done so well in high-income countries with a lot of current uh, practice of care based on younger cohorts from trials. But again, this is an area that needs to be looked at. So what I proposed was to do an exploratory analysis in a middle-income country. And I chose Mexico in many respects because it typifies much of the socio-economic, demographic and epidemiological changes that are occurring in middle income countries. And I wanted to use Mexico as a step case study to explore this interface within aging. Just a few sort of, uh, stats about Mexico, well it's the second largest economy in Latin America. There's an estimated population of close to 120 million. Currently, the population, and when, I'm when I say sort of elderly, I mean I'm describing a population age 65 and above. There's seven and a half million, or close to eight million, and this represents approximately seven percent of the total population. This is projected by 2030 that this is going to increase by eight and a half million uh, to 16.2 million representing 14% of the population. So really rapid population aging that's occurring in Mexico specifically. It faces a dual burden of disease, uh, both communicable and non-communicable diseases, but predominantly non-communicable diseases as with um, sort of the middle income countries in the higher income echelons. But there is a difference in profile across the country. So, for instance, the southern regions have lower socioeconomic development, and there's a twofold increase in the number of, um, so there's a twice as many uh, communicable disease deaths compared to the more affluent areas, and also the outcomes from the non communicable diseases are worse. What about the health system? Well, it's considered to be quite inefficient um, and fragmented, and of the OECD countries, has the lowest public spending on healthcare. Uh, social security exists for the formerly employed, and when I talked about fragmentation, there uh, a plethora of uh, public purchaser and provider combinations as such, and very um, fragmented private sector as well. But IMSS is the largest sort of social security funder for those formerly employed. Since 2003, Seguro Popular has been uh, providing social security for the informal sector and low income groups who meet the uh, eligibility criteria. And it's now approximately 60, nearly close to sort of 55, 60 million people covered by this insurance screen. But the coverage by uh, health insurance groups is inequitable, especially amongst low income groups. So when I looked at the study aim, when I proposed the study aims, I wanted to first of all look at what are the relevant research puts, outputs related to cancer and aging in Mexico, looking at geriatric oncology, looking at the disease burden, etc. I wanted to also um, estimate, well, we know 
what the populate how the population is going to expand, the elderly population is going to expand. Can we estimate what the burden of disease is within different tumor types and the proportion uh, of which the elderly will be affected by in particular? I also wanted to assess the prevalence of socioeconomic factors that potentially impact on the access and outcomes from cancer care and investigate the health system as a role to see how within cancer care itself it's um, widened or reduced health inequalities from the available evidence. So in terms of the methods, they used a multi-pronged approach really. So a literature review looking at web of science, PubMed um, and Embase. A bibliometric analysis of research outputs. Now I'll go into bibliometrics in a bit more detail shortly, but essentially it's a, for those who are not aware, it's a, it's a way of quantifying or um, analysing research outputs for a given country. You can look at areas of particular research domains, the amount of international collaboration that's done, funding towards different research projects. So it gives us that strategic intelligence to know where, where the majority of the research is being undertaken. Um, formally, at the moment, there isn't a, a cancer registry, or there wasn't up until 2012 uh, within uh, uh, Mexico. So one of the tools that I used to estimate what the, the incidence and the future burden would be was this Globacan database, which is uh, been produced by the International Association for Research in Cancer in France. Um, it's a really valuable tool which I'll go through. Uh, I analysed death certificate data that was available and also used microdata from three population level surveys, two of which, um, if I go to the next slide, were nationally representative and this included a national housing and population census as well as the national survey on nutrition and health. There was a further survey on global ageing and adult health which was undertaken by the WHO looking at six low and middle income countries including China, uh, Mexico, South Africa uh, with uh, two and a half individuals. So if I start off by going through the cancer incident projections. I said that the cancer registry wasn't available. So I was able to use this Globacan software to estimate 2000 uh, changes in the incidence of cancer between 2012 and 2030. And in the absence of cancer registry data, the Globacan software had used death certificate data to estimate what the incidence is based on countries with a similar socio-epidemiological profile and to project this accordingly. And it's estimated that by 2030 there's going to be close to 110,000 extra cancer cases per year, which is a huge number, of which nearly 60% will be in men and women aged over 65. If we look at particular specific cancers, I've looked at uh, incidents for lung cancer and comparing with 2080, which was the older version of the Globacan software in 2030, what we were finding was that there was a significant rise in the proportion of lung cancer cases as would be expected with this de demographic transition, so close to nearly 8,000. And 75% of these cancers were in men and women over the age of 65. So lung cancer in particular is, uh, is projected to be a significant burden. If you look at something like prostate cancer, which is predominate in men um, over the age of 65, there's going to be nearly a two-fold, two to three-fold increase in the number of cases, again, the majority of which will be in men over the age of 65. And I also brought in breast cancer because this is the commonest cancer type in uh, Mexico for women uh, along with survival cancer. And over this period of time, there's going to be nearly 14,000 new cases and 38% of which is in the over 65s. But again, you know, there, this affects all, all these different types of cancers, given that 7% um, going up to 14% of the population will be over 65, predominates in this age group. If you look at patterns of cancer mortality uh, from the death registration data I had uh, in 2010, look that 55% of cancer deaths are in elderly men and women. It's a huge proportion given the numbers and that the rate of deaths increased sharply over the age of 45 uh, and predominantly more in men than in women. So if we look at this slide which was based on all deaths stratified by age looking at the number of cancer deaths 
per 100,000 of the population, you can see this sharp rise. And obviously, this to some degree would be expected given that there's a greater burden uh, in individuals at over 65. But this also suggests that actually they're not doing as well uh, from, from their care. With regards to the general population, the largest causes of cancer deaths are in lung cancer, so approaching 10, uh, nearly 10%, gastric cancer 8%, and prostate cancer 8%. If we look at men of all ages, prostate and lung cancer are the commonest causes of cancer death, and women it's breast and cervical. But if we look at this age group over 65, prostate, lung, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, which again has got an uh, infectious disease etiology uh, in the majority of cases from hepatitis B, hepatitis C, gastric cancer, they're the main ones. Breast and cervical, cerv cervical cancer, although very important in terms of the general female population, don't have as big a burden in the over 65 population. This brought me to the bibliometric evaluation. And as I mentioned, this is a quantitative analysis of publications and research activity. And you create algorithms which essentially try and pass out publications from a specific country within all journals worldwide and to um, estimate or understand what were the specific tumor types they were looking at and the cancer research domains. So having seen the information about uh, where the sort of burden of disease was in terms of the cancer sites, one of the areas I wanted to look at which were what were the specific uh, research outputs by cancer type within Mexico. So um, the majority were in cervical and so uh, the cancer types in the bars in pink refer to female cancers. Uh, green uh, men and women, uh, men and female cancers, and blue uh, male cancers. But as you can see, that cervical cancer and breast cancer have by far and away uh, the majority of the research um, inputs, followed by leukemia and lymphoma. If we look further down, I was mentioning uh, liver cancer, um, esophageal cancer, prostate cancer. They had much less research in those areas. So what we tried to do was to correlate this uh, in a graph looking at the burden of disease related to death and the amount percentage of cancer research papers. And we looked at research papers over uh, nearly a 25-year pe period from 1989 to 2012. So it's, it's um, quite robust in terms of the number of papers that we were looking at. And as you can see at the top, we have cervical. First of all, there's no correlation but actually cervical and breast cancer relative to the, the burden of significantly more research into these areas. But that doesn't mean it's insufficient. I would think it suggests that actually in areas such as lung cancer in the bottom right of your screen, uh, pancreatic prostate, um, uh, esophageal cancer, don't have sufficient uh, amount of research in these areas. When we look at research types and research domains, so genetics, chemotherapy, they refer to sort of prognostic markers, genetic um, and molecular studies, chemotherapy relating to systemic treatments, and then further down, looking at radiology, screening, palliative care and quality of life. They have much less. So even though for the, so what this tells us overall is that the specific disease sites that are getting the majority of research attention and that within the research domain, they tend to focus on more biological um, outputs um, and chemotherapy related outputs than those which may have a more public health impact such as screening and disease epidemiology. My literature review identified about 500, about 500 relevant papers, but I only found 15 articles which reported on some aspects of aging and cancer. Uh, there are two or three articles which really related to the SAVE study, which was a uh, health and well-being and aging in Latin America, and looked at six uh, cities across Latin America, including Mexico City. This found that uh, the illiterate, low educated, and uninsured older men and women had lower rates of cancer screening compared to their younger counterparts. There are also some uh, small case theories from individual hospitals which demonstrated that there was a survival differential between elderly and younger adults for uh, a number of disease sites, the colorectal, breast, gastric, and lung cancer. But there was no articles exploring the reason for this differential between 
the elderly and younger cohorts, or any literature exploring what the understanding and perception of cancer was in elderly adults. I mean, for instance, fear, lack of knowledge, anxiety related to cancer diagnosis have all been um, cited in the wider cancer literature. So in order to sort of develop a framework for further analyses, I looked at the wider literature related to cancer um, and elderly cohorts within Mexico. Uh, as I pointed out previously, overwhelmingly this is predominantly in breast and cervical cancer, and there are a number of good studies done in this area um, using qualitative, often qualitative research, but also some observational data. And what this found was that socioeconomic factors were strongly associated with higher rates of mortality, not just sort of poverty and low levels of literacy, but aspects of unemployment and uh, consequent lack of social security, uh, rural residents, uh, and marginalization or social isolation were particular issues that came out. A big factor was an advanced stage of diagnosis, um, which had a major impact on survival. Pretty much that when patients received a diagnosis, they either had stage three or stage four disease, and they were not able to receive curative treatment. Now, the predisposing factors for this are, are multiple, but I think a big thing related to the health system itself, the limited availability of oncological services affecting um, access, uh, significant delays in diagnosis, um, and also aspects of health insurance coverage, low screening uptake. And what I wanted to do, given that these would have been looked at in sort of the different age group cohorts, is to analyze or to, to assess the prevalence of these predisposing factors in elderly men and women from the available uh, surveys that uh, we had from Mexico. So if we start off with socioeconomic profile um, and the educational status, uh, which I looked at from the SAVE survey, those aged over 65, predominantly found that actually, um, so I've split this into rural and urban, so approximately 25% of elderly men and women live in rural settings in Mexico and 75% in urban settings. But actually a significant proportion um, had not um, complete, had any education beyond primary school, and specifically in the rural area, not really had any formal education at all. And this fits in with late rates of illiteracy from other studies. When we're looking at employment status, the other thing that stands out, so we're looking at percentage employed, um, and this is age categories from 65 to 80 plus on the left-hand column. We're looking at percentage employed, percentage non-employed, the use, the use of the term non-employed because this includes those working in the informal sector and also a percentage undertaking household activities. You can see that nearly in rural settings, nearly one in four men over the age of 80 were still employed. And that fits in with what we know about Mexico, which out of the OECD countries has the highest effective retirement age, uh, low levels of social security, so men um, in particular are continuing to work even sort of in the other age categories from 65 onwards, both in rural and urban settings. And also if you look on the far right, we see the importance that female role that females play in the household uh, with household duties um, at all the different age groups. Looking at sources of income, this came from the Housing and Population Census, the categories were um, the of pension, help from relatives um, outside of Mexico, help from relatives within Mexico and government programs. Again, there's disparities between rural and urban settings, but I think the first main thing to look at with regards to pension is that in urban settings, although it's not a high amount, but approximately sort of 50 percent, uh, 50 to 60 percent are covered by a um, pension uh, but actually that was mainly for men and women less so. Um, and I'll say compared to the rural settings, this is actually about 20% uh, for males and 10% for females. And if we look at the percentage support from uh, government programs, you can see that actually close to nearly 80% in rural settings and those above 75 are receiving uh, support. And this is less in urban settings, but actually um, programs such as ProCampo were offering assistance to, to elderly men and women. I think it's interesting that there is this disparity between females and males, and actually you can notice this in particular with regards to the help from relatives uh, within Mexico. Um, as I'll come on to uh, another uh, table shortly, I think the female uh, elderly population receiving support from elsewhere, and that's partly because a number are widowed at an older age, which I'll show later. With regards to health insurance coverage, 
and take it to the far right column. So I've got the main insurers, but the far right is the proportion of uninsured with health insurance coverage. Within urban settings, it's about 20%, and rural settings, it's close to sort of 35%. And actually, if we look at the main uh, insurers, the in the urban settings, it's IMSS, uh, it's main social security, which provides main health insurance coverage. And in rural settings, it's Segura Popular, and it's about 35%. However, from more recent data, it's probably up to 50, 55% now for rural settings, with the same disparity in urban settings, with predominantly IMSS as the main insurer. So just back to what I was saying earlier about this aspect of the social network. So households headed by women aged 65 and above uh, tends to be smaller than those headed by elderly men. And actually, from the SAGE survey, nearly 50% of females um, over the age of 65 from their cohort were um, widowed. And this sort of points to the, the support that they get from relatives in terms of the income stream, but also many are not enrolled within generalized insurance schemes. And the risk of isolation is very much there. So this, came, this next table came related to analysis of the health and nutrition survey. And the question that was posed well, was a section of the paper which was only completed if the individual had received some form of care, uh, hospital care or health care within the last two weeks. And asked the question, what were the duration of symptoms for that health, for that health care issue? And if we look at the far right, the greater than 12 months, you can see that actually compared to the sort of 20 to 64 age group of adults, the duration of symptoms prior to presentation, uh, 40 to 50 percent nearly had symptoms for over 12 months, suggests that there could be uh, that delays of occurring before people present, although it's not possible to ascertain what those reasons might well be. I also assessed uh, using the same uh, data set the proportion of the different types of healthcare facility used. So IMSS and Secretary de Salud were uh, nas so National Health Services, the Secretary de Salud, um, supplied by the Ministry of Health and IMSS, the public purchaser. But actually, even those, even despite those being the main two, we can see that actually a significant proportion of elderly men and women use private facilities and pharmacies in particular. Regards to out-of-pocket payments, uh, and this then asked the question for their last uh, visit that they had to the clinic within that two-week period, did they have to pay? Uh, and actually, sort of one in four to one in three did have to pay uh, an amount towards this, and that depended not on the healthcare facility that was being used. So, what does this all mean, really? Well. Not just from the data that I've presented, there's been a number of studies that have um, happened in Mexico. We can see that older Mexicans experience more poverty than working age groups. They often need additional sources of income, be it from family or government programs, because of the low levels of social security. And that finding is exa exacerbated when you compare rural settings with urban settings. The, there's a larger proportion uh, in the informal sector, and so they're less likely to have health insurance. And individuals are working to maintain it uh, for uh, over their uh, to older ages in Mexico. And this might affect whether they seek medical care because of the potential loss of earnings. Data has shown that um, many, don't, many elderly men and women don't present to the doctor because they're trying to save up money to, for the tests. And if you imagine sort of the diagnostic process and treatment process for something like cancer care, the actual burden is quite significant in terms of costs. There also seems to be some evidence of uh, delayed presentation from the earlier work, but we're not quite sure what the reasons are. I pointed about that when at the beginning about uh, the health system factors which may be exacerbating um, or reducing inequities or not helping with access. Well, I mean, first and foremost, there are a significant number of um, elderly that are having to pay out-of-pocket payments um, and using private facilities. And this despite coverage by Securo Popular. And the actual sentence isn't quite correct. So 
for the sort of 250 sort of approved indications to Euro Popular does cover um, the costs of drugs, etc. But actually, for the use of Ministry of Health Services, where individuals have no insurance, they do have to pay out-of-pocket payments um, for drugs. And in many respects, especially high-cost cancer drugs, a lot of these aren't available in the first place. When I when we talk about the private facilities themselves, this is a very fragmented system in itself. You might, um, one study showed that one in three didn't have um, a full-time doctor present. They might not have diagnostic facilities. And increasingly, pharmacies are seen as a gateway for having access uh, to a, a professional or an opinion. And so one can't measure the quality of that. But this is in part borne out by a sort of low level of trust within the public system. And this is not just the sort of Ministry of Health, this is with IMSS facilities, which is the main social um, health insurer for those in, who are in formal employment. Often considered inferior, difficult to access, and plagued by excessive waiting times. So two studies that looked in breast cancer found that on average, uh, the number of clinic visits required before a diagnosis of breast cancer was uh, uh, upwards of sort of five to eight, um, and that the time taken from the initial presentation of symptoms to diagnosis was about six or seven months, and that is completely, you know, that's a, that, that, that changes the whole game, really, in that ability to get individuals or to find individuals who have potentially curative disease, as opposed to those who can only, will only need sort of control of their disease. Uh, with palliative measures. Um, uh, there's excessive bureaucracy and a lack of privacy and courtesy has also been cited. But what about cancer facilities in particular? Well, there's gaps in cancer care coverage full stop. So um, in terms of what modalities of treatment do you need for cancer care for cure? Well, 60% of cure requires surgery, 40% radiotherapy, and actually 5% of cures require uh, chemotherapy. And radiotherapy is delivered with linear accelerators, which is the radiotherapy machine. And the whole of Mexico, for 120 million people, there are 20 linear accelerators for 32 states, of which seven are located in the very urbanized Mexico City. So this just goes to prove what essential access problems you have for such an important modality of treatment, especially in rural settings. Although Seguro Popular has reduced catastrophic expenditures uh, since it was integrated and an increasing number have um, enrolled into this uh, social, uh, social insurance scheme, this has been at the cost of an increasing reduction in the availability of human and capital resources, especially within Ministry of Health uh, institutions. So when I talk about human and capital resources, I mean uh, reasonable doctors, less uh, availability of drugs, um, diagnostics um, within these settings. Another factor uh, was that the federal fund was created to protect against catastrophic health expenditures for very high cost interventions. Uh, for, for those who are uninsured, and this included a wide range of cancers. But what I find, uh, and this up until 2012, and this is still the case, when I was analysing the data, I found that lung, gastric and liver cancers, which both predominate in the elderly cohorts and cause uh, the majority of cancer-related deaths in Mexico, are not covered by this insurance scheme. This was all the more worrying because there's no real screening tool for these malignancies, and diagnosis uh, and treatment are incredibly complex. So if you take lung cancer, you might need uh, an ultrasound, a chest x-ray, a CT scan, a bronchoscopy, uh, a biopsy, and then treatment might be entail four months of chemotherapy with six weeks of radiotherapy. So you can see that actually if you're not protected from these expenditures, that the ability to actually receive this treatment um, is it's actually probably very small, uh, or if an LDR are able to pay, that they face catastrophic expenditures in doing so. Also, the symptoms associated with um, late uh, diagnosis or advanced disease are huge, um, breathlessness, um, bleeding, etc. And so this in itself highlights uh, the need for palliative care. I mean, the, the question is, because we don't know this question, are there a large number of LV with this disease who are not presenting at all, who are dying at home from an unknown disease? This is something that really 
hasn't been explored whatsoever and highlights the requirement of, well, is there any palliative care expertise for these individuals? Um, and actually the studies that have, I've seen within Mexico shows that there has been not absence of policies and opioids um, persist in being difficult to access uh, for pain relief. So my overall conclusions from this uh, analysis that I undertook is that, first of all, this is a very under-researched area uh, and that we know that the burden of cancer will increase and that this will fall disproportionately so on elderly populations who appear to do worse. The tumour types that are being researched in Mexico, I haven't looked in other countries, tends to be afforded, afforded limited research priority compared to others such as breast and cervical cancer. And what was key to this is that those socioeconomic factors or predisposing factors from the Mexican literature which were associated with poor cancer outcomes such as poverty, low levels of literacy, um, marginalization were heavily prevalent within elderly cohorts. Um, this included low levels of health insurance and the necessity to work which may result in delays in presentation. I think there are also wider health system factors due to the insurance scheme, the quality of services, the availability of services, which are widespread issues, not just for the elderly, but the additional uh, difficulties or potential difficulties in access may make it harder. And there are concerns about late presentation and whether this relates to symptom recognition. Also, as I mentioned, Segura, not Segura Popular, but this catastrophic expenditure fund doesn't cover um, those tumor types are the greatest burden and so the elderly really are at risk of impoverishing expenditures from cancer diagnosis and delays in treatment. So just in my final slide, uh, I think in terms of key research priorities, I mean they're, they're fairly obvious but again th this work does need to be done and it's looking at sort of cancer epidemiology in elderly populations, do we know what stage they're presenting with, what treatments they're receiving, what their outcomes of care are, what are the perceptions um, uh, and barriers towards presenting with a, a presumed diagnosis of cancer or the understanding of cancer within elderly populations? And also looking at specific health system barriers which affect um, elderly populations. And uh, potentially researching methods for improving general cancer awareness and education amongst the elderly. And that completes my presentation. I just wanted to say a thanks to Carlos Saldana, who's at the National Cancer Institute, who uh, undertook this work with me, uh, Richard Sullivan at King's College London, and Grant Lewison, um, who informed the bibliometrics research. Uh, and the references uh, would be available from a public manuscript that we published related to this, which is uh, available through this link. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Argerwal, for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. Um, if anybody in the audience has any questions, uh, please type them in the chat uh, box and I will um, uh, moderate it and present those questions to our presenter. Um, I want to start off with a very general question and um, you laid out very clearly, um, you know, that there will be um, some significant consequences in, in Mexico as an example of a lower to middle income country and you know you demonstrated where um, the gaps are in, in the socio-economic uh, makeup of the country and the health systems and of course um, lots of research is needed to further develop policies to alleviate uh, your predictions. Um, are, they, are there any other uh, cancer control strategies uh, for example, that have been developed in other countries that may, in the interim, uh, prevent some of your predicted outcomes? It's a very good question. I think a lot are in its infancy. So I was involved in work in um, India, um, so a couple of uh, research uh, projects that I was working on, which essentially show that they've developed something called the National Cancer Grid and they're developing good tools for epidemiologic, uh, sort of epidemiological work. But this aspect of uh, inequity within provision is very hard to um, overcome because, as I said at the beginning, this is a question, it's, it's not just related to health system effects, this is a question of sort of wider society and the political eco economy and actually where do, where are elderly, with, as, how do, how are elderly perceived what are their sort of rights, what is their um, means by which they can access cancer care. And I don't think 
there's any particularly great model that I know of that has been developed in other countries as yet. And that's why I, I, I chose to do exploratory analysis because there's no work that's been done in this area related to the elderly in these cohorts specifically. And I wanted just to highlight what some of the issues that may come that come about and need to be looked at. Okay, thank you very much. And I guess related to my question was a question as well from um, a, um, a listener. Um, you know, how typical your analysis uh, was of Mexico of other low to middle income uh, countries or is, can you make a, you know, does each uh, country have specific challenges or can your results be extrapolated to many of the other low to middle income uh, countries? I think in terms of the cancer burden uh, for middle income countries, I think Mexico is very typical and I'll explain why. There was a, a piece of work done about three or four years ago looking at the types of cancers related to the Human Development Index, which looked at GDP and education status, etc. And it showed that countries such as Mexico or similar countries were faced with this dual cancer burden where they were transitioning from cancers related to infectious diseases such as sort of HPV and hepatitis, etc., to a more risk factor driven, non-communicable disease cohorts. Also in terms of the organization of services and the, 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 the integration of social health insurance schemes, many countries probably haven't reached the stage that um, Mexico has reached, but there are similar countries in, in that bracket in, ter in terms of um, trying to achieve financial protection for those uh, most vulnerable. So I would say that actually Mexico is very very typical, but probably more of the higher end and more developed end of middle income than other countries, for instance, especially those in Africa. Hello? Great. Sorry, I was talking without my talk button on. Thank you for your um, answer to that question. And related to that answer in low to middle co income um, countries, there was another question of, you know, how will the scenarios be in actual low income countries that are maybe not as well off as a country like Mexico? Uh, can you make any predictions there? It's very hard. So I think the, the demographic challenge is slightly different. So they're a bit further behind in middle income countries in terms of this rapid aging. And so you very much have still a, a, many of these countries which face this a predominantly communicable disease burden which are managed with sort of verti vertical structures, so you know the HIV burden, malaria, that sort of test and treat and various things like that and then you have this emerging, can uh, emerging cancer diagnosis and in a lot of these countries so far, they don't actually ha often have a formalized cancer control program so again a lot of the work is quite exploratory almost trying I think the hardest thing and the most important thing is to actually work out how many people are suffering from cancer, what types of cancer and how they're presenting. And that, it seems very obvious, but that information is made, missing for the vast majority of low-income countries in many respects, and it has to be sort of um, done from survey data, but no one really knows the answers to those questions. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Dr. Carr is, um, what role do you think organizations such as the PIH and uh, MSF can play in NCV care in low to middle income countries? So I'm not 100% sure what those abbreviations are. I believe um, PIH is the Population Institute of Health and Medicine Sans Frontier, but uh, maybe you can elaborate. The question is in the chat um, section, um, Dr. Agarwal. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of groups working in this space as such, um, such as the WHO, the UICC, they're, they're, who are trying to work within low and income countries, work within partners there. And I think there are a number of uh, groups that have important roles to play. I think it's, it's getting that strategy right. It's actually engaging with the communities and understanding the importance of where cancer is because you have to understand that in many of these countries cancer is, a, is, a, is an emerging issue compared to all the other sort of plethora of diseases which they're working from. I mean it's still not that widely acknowledged that rates of cervical cancer or deaths related to cervical cancer are often higher in low income countries than that of HIV or malaria. Um, and 
the it's I think there has to be a change in our thought process towards issues related to non-communicable diseases because the amount of structural um, require structural change required within health systems and wider society is quite profound. So I think actually it is important to get um, MSF and PIH involved. I'm not sure of what specifically they're involved in with NCDs at the moment, but there are a number of other organizations working there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is another question where uh, Dr. Carr says, cancers aren't seen as low-hanging food for uh, NGOs and funders. How do, you, how do you see the private donor network to be involved? That's a very good question. Um, it's difficult to say. I, I completely agree it isn't a low-hanging fruit at all. Um, I think there is a lot of scope, but I think there's scope if it's done in a correct integrated way. It can't just be about, um, which I often hear at conferences, oh, let's try and fundraise so we can get 10 machines into this country, ready therapy machines into this country. Let's create two new laboratories. There has to be a system and a process of um, initiating what the need is, looking at the demand, and actually dealing with the local population, the workforce, and pl planning, otherwise it's not sustainable, it's just too complex a disease. So I think prime that donors are important, but actually it has to be a, of a wider strategy which knows exactly what they need to put in place step by step. Okay, thank you. Another question was posed to, to say, in terms of challenging challenges, did the study also find any views on women's social status and socioeconomic conditions while diagnosing and preventing disease? I'm not sure what, if I understand the question entirely. Is it asking? Um, it's the sort of while diagnosing and preventing disease. What, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what the question means. In terms of social taste, status and socioeconomic in terms of social status and socioeconomic condition, there does appear to be a, a disparity uh, for women uh, relative to men in terms of the their social insurance cover the uh, okay, I've just I've just seen add on to the room. Yes, I, I do think there is an issue with uh, female empowerment and social status, in particular the, the proportion that were formerly employed compared to the amount of work doing household duties, the proportion who were more likely to be widowed, the proportion who were going to be in smaller households where they were leading it. I think there does appear to be a, uh, a sort of a, a, a gender difference in that. However, it seems that the majority of the mortality is actually in elderly men uh, relative to elderly women, but I think some entrenched social status issues for females could affect their ability to present with symptoms related to the diagnosis of cancer, which does need to be explored further. And I think qualitative research fits in very well to try and explore that paradigm, as it has done um, for younger cohorts within Mexico. Okay, thank you. Um, there's about five minutes left. Uh, if there's any more questions, please type them in the chat um, box. I have kind of a, a more of a philosophical question for you, Dr. Arawal. Um, our, our population around the globe is um, aging quite rapidly. How optimistic are you that um, interventions or control strategies will catch up to avoid some of the disastrous consequences that you could predict based on your findings? Uh, if I'm being honest, I think it's very difficult. I just, I see the challenges that happen in a high income country. I mean, my clinical practice working as an oncologist, see the sort of inequity that occurs between different social groups here and the outcomes that happen to try and recreate a comprehensive health, sort of health system to manage cancer care where, in the, where there's high levels of inequity in terms of income, where not everyone is covered by insurance, where there's a lack of availability of very high cost technologies. So for instance, a radiotherapy machine costs one and a half million pounds um, individually. It's very hard to see how 
you can get the equivalent development and the social health coverage or protection that they require in order to keep up with this demand. But that's why you know it's so important that the work that's being done um, and there's a lot of work that comes out in the Lancet looking at sort of Millennium Development goal, Goals and looking at uh, NCDs as a future challenge, but it's so important. But back to your original sort of question in terms of philo philosophical, I think it's going to be incredibly uh, difficult. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Agarwal. It was a very comprehensive presentation. We really enjoyed it uh, to look at all the different aspects uh, and the impact on this uh, on the future of low to middle income um, um, countries. Um, this ends our CLSA webinar. I just want to highlight our next um, online seminar, which will be held on March 24th by Dr. Bornstein. Um, from uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, and it will talk also uh, how research can help shape our policy and practicing for the aging population in Canada. So we hope to see you then as well. Again, thank you very much for your uh, attendance, and we hope to see you in the future.